الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my respected brothers and my sisters in islam today is the last surah of juz tabarak and Allah musta'an how quickly Ramadan has passed and how quickly we are at the end subhanallah of our few days remaining in Ramadan I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with this to forgive us have mercy on us to accept us from those who are close to him to make us of those people who are not from the ghafileen to make us of those people from the ahl al-quran and to make us of those people who read the Quran and obey its commands. Today, alhamdulillah, we have Surah Al-Nazi'at. Surah Al-Nazi'at. Uh, I'm sorry, apologize. Surah Al-Mursalat. Surah Al-Mursalat. I thought we would go to Nazi'at. Khair. We are in Surah Al-Mursalat. And Surah Al-Mursalat, like Surah Al-Nazi'at and like Surah Naba, which are the next two surahs right after Surah Al-Mursalat, are all to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger are all to do with the anger of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about those people who disbelieve in him about those people who do not believe in Rasulullah sallallahu about those people who disbelieve in the day of judgment so just like surah insan the surah just before was about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran balances the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his anger as well so that you understand that to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot do so through only one emotion. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be through love and fear and hope as well. Love and fear and hope. So just like Surah Insan was about Jannah and describing Jannah and how beautiful Jannah is, for those people who do simple deeds like feeding the poor, alhamdulillah, Surah Mursalat is about those people who disbelieve in the day of judgment and so they earn the anger of Allah and so Allah describes Jahannam in it and Allah describes the punishment that he has prepared for those people who are mukaddibin in fact you know how surah ar-rahman constantly repeats one verse what is the verse that you know you always repeat in surah ar-rahman everyone knows this right the verse that is constantly repeated in surah mursalat on the other hand is uh, more than 10 times Allah repeats this in Surah Mursalat more than 10 times Allahu Akbar so it shows you therefore that this message in this whole Quran and this Surah is all about giving the warning to the Mukaddibin those people who are truly the liars and the true liars and who are the liars those who lie about Allah and those who hide the truth my brothers and my sisters in Islam, there are many, many important fawaid in this. I just wanted to take before we even get started. What does wail mean? The scholars of Tafsir have said wail means two things. It means either woe. So woe to the mukaddibin, woe to those who lie. Yeah? So woe, it can mean woe, meaning an exclamation of pain and punishment. Uh, the second meaning is as the scholars of Tafsir said is that whale is a valley in Jahannam is the name of a valley in Jahannam which is one of the worst and the deepest valley in Jahannam they said that there are many valleys of Jahannam that are mentioned in the Quran what are the different valleys of Jahannam that you know of one is whale uh, another one is a valley of Ghayy فَخَالَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُ الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُ الشَّهَوَاتِ so the valley of Ghay is also one of the valleys mentioned in the Quran. What is the valley of Ghay? The valley of whale on, the, on one hand is a valley which is full of fire and molten tar. And it is where the, the dangerous beasts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that will ambush people. Because Allah says in the Quran in Surah Naba, Inna Jahannam kanat mirsada. Verily, Jahannam is a place of ambush. Meaning, Allah has created animals therein made of fire that will ambush the people in Jahannam. That is a, that is a valley of whale. On the other hand, valley of Ghay. The valley of Ghay 
as the scholars of Tafsir mentioned it, is a valley in Jahannam which contains the body parts of all the people who have been beaten up and their body parts have been cut off. So if someone has their body parts cut off and their pus that is flowing down Jahannam, then the valley of Ghai contains the pus and the body parts of the human beings and jinn that, have been, that are being tortured in Jahannam. Allahum sta'ad. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, these are the two valleys that are mentioned in, Jahan, in, in the Quran. So Allah keeps promising whale, this valley of whale or woe to those people who are mukaddibin, those who are liars. Mukaddibin, who are the mukaddibin? Remember I kept telling you this in the Quran, in the Quran, kufr wa takdeeb is sawa, is the same. And that is why in the authentic hadith in Bukhari, it was reported that a sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, can a Muslim be can a Muslim be a coward? And the Prophet said, Yes. Then another and then he continued and he said, Can a Muslim be a miser? He said, Yes. Okay, it's possible to be a bad Muslim but a miser, a bad Muslim but be a coward, right? But can a Muslim be a liar? The Prophet said, no. He said, no, it's impossible. And that's why Rasulullah said in an authentic hadith in Bukhari, he said, be careful of lies. For verily the lies guide you to fujur, which is sinning, and fujur yahdi ila nar, and the fujur will lead you to Jahannam. Okay, so ya khwati, it's very important to never lie. On the other hand, the Prophet also said, Always speak the truth, for indeed the truth guides you to Bir and Bir guides you to Jannah. And this is an authentic hadith in the books of the Sunan of the Prophet. Ya khwati, we also know Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said, Never ever lie, never ever lie, even if it kills you. Never lie, even if it kills you. So, my brothers of Islam, we should never ever lie we should never ever come close to lying never lie never lie never cheat in your exams never speak an untruth matter never ever speak a lie because if you lie Allah will write your name down as one of the liars and lying is synonymous with kufr lying is synonymous with kufr in the Quran and that is why Allah doesn't say fawailul lil kafirin Allah says fawailul lil mukaddibin wailu yawma idhil lil mukaddibin I hope that this is very important. And remember this, this advice of mine, never ever speak a lie. Always speak the truth. A Muslim never lies. طيب. So Surah Mursalat ikhwati, is all about the anger of Allah for those who lie about Him. And those who, speak the tru- who, those who do not speak the truth about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. In the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Mursalat. What are the Mursalat? So the Mursalat, the scholars of the sea said, are of two things, are either one of two things. The first description of Mursalat are the Ar-Rih al-Mursala, or the wind that comes with, with, with clouds laden with rain. So wh- why do we call Rih al-Mursala in Arabic? We call it Rih al-Mursala means the clouds that bring the, 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 the wind that brings the clouds laden with rain, you know? Have you seen those black clouds that are full of water that will mashallah pour down with, with rain? That is called the Mursalat. The second meaning of Mursalat as the scholars of Tafsir said is the angels, are the angels because they are the Rusul, they are the, they are the Rusul that are Mursal that are sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you will find in the English translation both these translations. In fact, one of the reasons I started teaching the tafsir of the Quran is was because when I came to this Surah Mursalat, I found one tafsir say referring to angels, another tafsir referring to clouds. And I thought, oh my God, what, what's going on? I'm not understanding. Why is, is one tafsir wrong? Is the other tafsir wrong? Is other one translation wrong? Other one wrong? And that's when I began to say, subhanAllah, reading just the English translation or the Malaysian translation or the Bengali translation, whatever translation you're reading, it's not enough because you get only a very small understanding of the whole verse. So these verses are either referring to the wind or they're referring to the angels. So when I describe, inshallah, and read the first few verses to you, 
I will describe the verses of how it would be if it was meaning was wind and how it would be if the meaning was angels. Tayyip. So here is one important point. How is it that some scholars are saying these verses refer to wind and other, uh, to, to clouds and others are saying it refers to angels? Is this not a tanaqud? Is this not a contradiction? We say no. We say the scholars of tafsir, when they say a verse might mean this and that, it does not mean contradiction. It means different faces or different images or different sides of the same meaning of the same coin. So imagine one coin has two sides. Okay, or multiple sides. And so, you're talking about the same verse that has two meanings. That's not necessarily one meaning goes against the other. So I could be an Islamic preacher at the same way I could be a, a medical doctor. That's not a contradiction of terms, is it? It's not. The only sect in the religion of Islam that has ever said this is a contradiction are the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila were the ones who said that if you give one sifa, one attribute to something you cannot give a second attribute and that is why they said that the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no meaning they said ar-rahman who ar-rahman bila rahma wa ghufran bila ghuf, uh, bila ghufran al-ghafir bila ghufran he is shakur bila shukur and he is the qawi bila quwa subhanallah hakadha qala al-mu'tazila why did they say this they said, because if you give more than one attribute to Allah, that means This necessitates more than one God. This reminds me of what the Jews and Christians did. Do you know that some of the, once it was reported that the Christians came to Rasulullah and said uh, to Rasulullah said, Ya Muhammad, there is Trinity in the Quran. What did they say? They said there is Trinity in the Quran. And the Prophet ﷺ said, How? Where is the Trinity in the Quran? Okay, Trinity meaning three God in one. Where is it in the Quran? So they said, Qulhu Allahu Ahad. Say Allah is one. Allahu Samad. He is the one who is ever, everlasting, ever living. Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. This is another God. So what they're saying is, As Samad, wa Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad are different gods. I said, You know, this is Ghabawa, foolishness. Ignorance. It's like saying you can be Malaysian and Australian at the same time. It's because you could be multiple. You could have a mother who is Malaysian and a father who is Australian, can't you? You can. Of course, Malaysia doesn't allow dual nationality, but for those countries that do, do allow it, okay, hint, hint. <laughs> but for those countries that do allow it, it is possible to have two, and one does not necessitate that the other one be inapplicable. Does that make sense, Ikhwati? So that's why, that's how we understand. If the tafsir of one verse has been given in two or three different ways, please never understand it to mean a tanaqud wa tadad. Do not understand it to mean contradiction. It means these are different wujuh of the same verse. These are different meanings of the same verse, inshaAllah. Tayyip. Then, in the middle part of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We'll talk about how is it that these mukaddibin do not believe in Allah Azawajal. Did they not see how they were created from a clot of blood? Did not they see how they were insignificant? Did they, did they not see and do they not see how human beings are created that they forget their creator? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jahannam. And he will give an amazing description of Jahannam. He will talk about the three columns of smoke that come out of Jahannam. Have you ever heard of the smoke that comes out of Jahannam? If you haven't, I'll tell you about the smoke that will come out of the fire of Jahannam where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Intaliqu ila ghillin di thalathi shu'ab la ghalilin wa la yughni min al So Allah will talk about this. Also Allah will talk about the hajab, the huge, the huge size of Jahannam. And one of the examples Allah will give to describe the huge size of Jahannam is Allah will not talk about the size of Jahannam but will talk about the sparks that will come out of Jahannam. The sparks, you know how when we welding, when we weld into the metal, you know you have sparks coming out and you put your cover so that the sparks don't come in your eyes. How big are the sparks? Not big at all, isn't it? They are small, tiny sparks. Tiny sparks, like tiny pebbles. But Allah says that the sparks of Jahannam are huge, like this huge masjid. 
Okay, can you imagine how huge this masjid is? MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. And if this was a palace, because this masjid is, is big enough to be a palace, imagine, ya ikhwati, this is how big one spark is. Ya salam, ya salam. And when the sparks come out, if you were to see it, you, would, you think they're like camels that are running away, a group of herd of camels that are running away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the description of Jahannam in this way. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a challenge to those people who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because those who disbelieve in Allah also disbelieve in the hereafter. And so Allah says, فَإِن كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ فَكِيدٌ Meaning if you have a plan to defeat me, then bring your plan out. Meaning Allah challenges the disbelievers that if you have a plan to defeat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or destroy Jahannam or to come out of Jahannam, then this is your chance. This is in response to the challenge that Abu Jahl said. Abu Jahl, when he heard there was 19 angels that were responsible over Jahannam, he said only 19 angels. So he got together with all his tribe, Quraysh, and he said, hey guys, how about 200 of us go to Jahannam and each 10 of us will take on one angel? I don't know, I mean, is he mad? Is he majnoon? Or is he both? Yeah, but this is the arrogance of, the, of kufr. Yeah, it's the arrogance of kufr that has gotten to Abu Jahl. Wallahi, he truly was the Fir'aun of this ummah. Because he spoke like Fir'aun. He spoke like Fir'aun. What did Fir'aun say? Ya Haman, ibn li sarhan la'alli ablughul asbab, asbab as-samawati wal-ardi li attali'a ila ilahi Musa, wa inni la'adhunnuhu kathiba. Look at his arrogance. Oh Haman, where are you? Where is Haman? Oh Haman, yes, come here, Haman. Who's Haman? Haman was the building manager, the building manager for his huge pyramids that he used to build. His name was Haman. He said, Haman, come here, Haman, where are you? Yes, Haman, can you build for me a big tower so that I may go up the mountains and I may climb up into the sky and look into the God of Moses because I think he's lying? What is, Mo what is Musa lying about? That God is in the sky. And that is why the Salaf, the Salaf Salih, the righteous, pious predecessors, they used to call the Jahmiyyah Fir'auniyun. Why did they call the Jahmiyyah Fir'auniyun? Because the Jahmiyyah were the first to say Allah is not in the sky. And so they used to call them Fir'auniyun. Because Fir'aun was the first of the disbelievers to ever claim Allah is not in the sky. That's why he said, build for me the tower. Tayyip. Anyway, that's another surah, inshallah, we'll come to that another time. Amazing. Tafsir is so beautiful. Wallahi, you should, you should really get into it, inshallah. Tayyip. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a challenge. فَإِن كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ فَكِيدٌ And then, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ uh, فَوَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contrasts this with the people of Jannah and what they will be in. And He ends the surah finally by telling the مُكَذِّبِينَ again and again, وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ It's only a small amount of time. كُلُوا وَتَمَتَّعُوا قَلِيلًا إِنَّكُمْ مُجِرِمُونَ Eat and drink a little bit, for indeed I am going to take you to account very, very fast. And the scholars of C said that therefore this verse is a proof that if Allah has given someone health, and if Allah has given someone wealth, and if Allah has given someone children, that this is never a proof of Allah's love for the love for you or Allah's good favor. It could be indeed Allah's trial and tribulation. It could be Allah's punishment. It could be Allah mocking you. Have they got a guarantee Allah is not mocking them? No one has a guarantee of the mockery of Allah except those people who have already lost all good. So, Yahwati, if Allah has given you children and Allah has given you wealth and Allah has given you status and power or anything in this dunya, it is not a sign Allah loves you. The only sign that Allah loves you. Yeah? And we know, of course, this is important because we know. That in many people, prosperity equals financial success. Today we judge countries by financial success. The Malaysian 2020 first world criteria to become the first world criteria is all economic criteria because we are judging it by financial success. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this is not the criteria of success with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The criteria of success with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taqwa. Even if worldly success and financial success is not there. 
So what therefore is the only criteria Allah wants good for you? What is the only criteria that Allah wants good for you? The only criteria is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fiddeen. Whoever Allah wants good for, he gives him good in the religion. He gives him knowledge of the religion. So Allah must want good for all of you here. Allah must want good for all of you here today, which is why he's giving you more knowledge today. And so rejoice, my brothers and, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Be happy and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every opportunity to gain knowledge is an indication Allah has accepted some good deed from you, inshallah. And Allah wants to guide you. If you fear Allah, Allah will teach you. Allah increases the guidance of those people who are already guided. Meaning, if you follow Allah's guidance, Allah will increase you in guidance. And because you obeyed Allah in Ramadan, that's why Allah is sharing this knowledge with you. So rejoice, my brothers in Islam. This is the only criteria Allah wants good for you and that Allah is happy with you. Tayyip. So this is Surah Mursalat, very beautiful Surah. Let's start inshallah with Surah Mursalat and take the meaning uh, of Surah Mursalat. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal Mursalati Urfa. Wal Mursalati Urfa. Remember the two meanings of Mursalat. It's either the wind, Rih al Mursala, the wind that carries with it clouds laden with rain, or it is the angels. So what does Urfa mean? Wal Mursalati Urfa. Urfa means, according to the language of the Arabs, Urfa means congregating together, that, that clamors together. So you are all coming together, and when you're congregating together, it's called Urfa. Okay? So Mursalati Urfa. Urf means custom, but Urfa also means congregating together. And that is where custom comes from, Urf. What is your custom? For example, the South African custom before eating food is to eat sweets before meat, before you meet. They eat their sweets before they eat their food. Amazing, isn't it? What is the Malaysian custom? The Malaysian custom is, uh, what is your custom by the way? What's your custom? Sorry, sorry to eat rice for breakfast. <laughs> for us in Australia, we find it very, very strange. But mashallah, yeah? Your, uh, your uh, custom is to eat rice or have a good meal, right? This is a, this is a custom and an urf of Malaysia. In Malaysia, for example, the custom is to not uh, be hard on people and to be soft and gentle and have beautiful akhlaq. So it's a custom of the people, urfa. So why has the word urf come from there? Urf has come from the meaning that people congregate together and they're together into one thing. And that's where urfa comes. So therefore, what is Allah referring to here? Allah is referring to the original meaning of urfa, which is well, mursalati urfa, when the angels come together and they descend together or they come down to earth together or the, rain, the clouds laden with rain, they are all dispersed, but because the wind brings them together and they come together. Wal mursalati urfa. Fal asifati asfa. And I swear by the asifa. What does asifa mean? The storm. And I swear by the storm. And by the stormy weather, okay? And if it is referring to angels, then Allah refers to the angels when they come descending down. As a tafsir of a shawkani rahimullah in Fayd al Qadir, in Fatul al Qadir, he says, Wal Asifa refers to the angels that shoot down from the sky. They come down so fast at lightning speed, and they are called the Asifa, they're called like the storm, because they come down so quickly. If you were to see them, it would be like a storm. And you know how. When you see the jet engine, when they go through, they create a stormy sound. And that is how quickly and faster than, of course, angels travel speed of light. They come down from the heavens. This is the Asifa. Fal Asifati Asfa. Wanna Shirati Nashra. And by the angels that, that spread out. And by the angels spread out. What do they spread out? They spread out the message of Allah. And they spread out the, the mercy of Allah on this earth. Or if it is referring to the clouds, then it talks about the clouds are spread out. After they come together and the wind blows and then the clouds spread out. And by the clouds that separate and the, the clouds tear up and they separate. Uh, or the angels that bring down the haqq and so they separate between the truth and the falsehood. 
They separate between the true, truth and the falsehood and they are called the angels of the furqa, the ones that differentiate between people and bring about the haq and the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرَى And by those angels that bring down yulqi al dhikr الَّذِينَ يُلْقُونَ الذِّكْرِ Yulqi means to throw. So alqa means to throw. وَأَلْقِ مَا بِيَمِينِكَ And throw what is in your right hand. Okay? As Allah told Musa salam. So yulqi means those who throw or to bestow. Right? Bestow what? Dhikra. The dhikr. What is the dhikr? The Quran. So what is Allah referring to? فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرَى مُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرَى Meaning those angels that bring down the revelation to the prophets of God. Okay? This is what is being referred to in this verse. فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرَى I swear by the angels who bring down the revelation to the prophets of God. So who is he swearing by? Jibreel alayhi sallallahu salam, Mikael alayhi sallallahu salam, and other angels that bring down the revelation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and to the other prophets. فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرَى عُذْرًا أَوْ نُذْرًا Meaning the revelation is of two types. Either a revelation of udr means a revelation of forgiveness and uh, excuse, aw nudra, or a revelation of punishment and warning. A, a revelation which contains punishment and warning, or a revelation that contains forgiveness and mercy, right? Udran aw nudra. That's what it means by, by that verse. Innama tu aduna la waqi'. Verily, that which you have been promised. Innama tu aduna la waqi' will definitely take place. So, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms that what we have been promised will offer surety take place in three ways. First is innama, verily of a surety. Verily of a surety. Innama tu aduna that you have been promised. So, therefore, Allah says it is a promise. And so this is the second way which Allah shows that what we have been promised, which is Jahannam and Jannah and the hereafter, will take place. This is the second way Allah shows it will definitely take place. And number three is Lam Ta'keed, the Lam. Can you see the Lam that has been added to the word Waqi'? La Waqi'. Meaning of a surety it will take place. So in three ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows that Allah's promise will take place. So when will it take place? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never answers that question, but answers the question by the signs of when it will take place, not the exact hour. So he says, What does tamasa mean? Tamas means when it is branded and stamped okay when it is branded and stamped we say thumbs so when something is branded and stamped we say tamasa okay so when the stars have been branded and stamped meaning they have lost their luster they've lost their light something has stamped them something has stopped their light from coming so there is no more light there from the stars and when the sky is torn apart and it is rent asunder. So faraja means what? Faraja means to have holes. See, if I were to take a pencil and take a, you know, a small paper, a paper, and I put holes in it, right? And then because of the holes become so flimsy, I tear it up. So either sama ufurijat, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the mountains, when the heavens will be torn apart and holed up. Wa either sama ufurijat. وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ نُسِفَتْ And when the mountains are torn into half. So when the mountains are ripped into half. And they become divided. Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah. He says, the mountains will be destroyed in four ways. He says in Fayd al-Qadir, Fathul qadir I keep saying Fayd al-Qadir. Fathul al qadir is the, is the book of Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah. One of the greatest books of Tafsir. If you want to learn all about Tafsir. From the Lugha and from the Balagha and from the asbab al-nuzul and from the meanings of the quran and from the hadith and from the riwayat of ibn abbas anhu, and of the sahaba you only need one book and that's called fath al-qadir of ash-shawkani rahimahullah fath al-qadir and this is mashallah one of the best books our sheikh used to tell us to read 
and of course <coughs> Fathul Qadir of Al-Shawkani rahimullah is nothing but the the summary of Qurtubi, Tafsir Qurtubi. Taib, let's move on. So in Fathul Qadir he says he says the mountains will be destroyed in four ways. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pluck the mountains out of the ground. Number two, the sound will destroy the mountains and break them into half, which is the sound of the blowing of the horn. Number three, Allah will cause the mountains to move. And, the, and because of the severe wind on that day, the mountains will move and they will crush against each other. This is number three. They will crush against each other and they will smash against each other. And because of this, number four is that they will turn into pulp and into sand and because the wind that blows it will look like a mirage meaning the, 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 sand, the mountains will be crushed turn, turn into pulp into sand and next thing you know because the wind that's blowing it, it is invisible it's gone so one minute you can see the mountains yes alunak anil jibal kul yansifuha rabbi nasfa say my lord will break it up into half allah will tear it destroy it into half such is the might and the power of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ نُصِفَتْ وَإِذَا الرُّسُلُ أُقِّتَتْ And when the messengers have been given the appointment أُقِّتَتْ meaning that they have been given the time, appointed time. Appointed time for what? They have been given an appointed time because when every single nation comes out in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the messenger that was sent to that nation will stand forward and he will say, Allah will ask him, did you give them the message? And they will say, yes, Ya Rabbi, by your will, we have given them the message. So this is the Rusul Uqqitat. That's why our Prophet ﷺ will either witness for us or against us. Who will he witness for? He will witness for those people who read the Qur'an and they followed his message. Who will he witness against? Those who rejected the Qur'an and did not listen to it and did not follow his sunnah. These are the people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the Prophet ﷺ witness for and against. وَإِذَا الرُّسُلُ أُقِّتَتْ And when the messenger, and when the messengers have been given the appointed time, first Adam, then comes Nuh, then comes so and so, all the messengers, one after the other, will witness against their people. وَإِذَا الرُّسُلُ أُقِّتَتْ The scholars of Islam, they said, the first messenger to be given the first appointed time will be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Because the first of the umam to be judged will be the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We will be the first people to be judged. Even before the Jews and Christians, the Ikhwati. Even before the Jews and Christians will be the first people to be judged. Allahum Musta'an. Wa idha rusul uqqitat li ayyi yawmin ujjilat. For which day have they been hurried? For which day are they now present? Are they present in front of Allah? Li yawmil fasl. For the day of judgment. Fasl means judgment. Hisab. That is the day of Fasl, meaning division between the people. Fasl, in the Arabic context, in the original Arabic word, it means to divide. So, fasala means to divide up and to put them into groups. Okay? So, yawm al-fasl means the day of division of people into groups or the day of judgment after which people will then be judged according to the good group or the bad group. Taib. Liyawm al-fasl. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الْفَصْلِ What will tell you what the day of judgment is. وَيْلُ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating suspense. Yeah? Do you know how to create suspense, brothers and sisters in Islam? The way to create suspense is to not answer the question. The way to create suspense is to not answer what people want. It was reported that when Hitler... When Hitler, look at this mastermind of evil. When Hitler, I'll tell you because it, it will illustrate what I'm trying to say. When Hitler was giving the first speech to start World War II, to start the war over Poland, when he conquered Poland, everyone was waiting for the lecture at 10 a.m. in the morning. Hitler arrived 10.30, half an hour late. So people were all waiting intentionally. He made them all wait. How long did he make them wait? Half an hour. And then Hitler came to the podium. Okay? Amazing. What a mastermind. He's a mastermind. He came to the podium and all he did was he looked at people like this. He looked at people. I mean, I don't know how he looked, but I'm just saying, I'm imagining how he looked at people. But he looked at people for five minutes without saying a single, single word. Without saying a single word. 
Okay? What did he say? For nothing, for, for five minutes. All he did. And can you imagine the suspense? What is he going to say? War, battle, jihad. What is he going to say? <laughs> what is he going to say? Do you know what he said? He said, we want peace. <laughs> That's why we have to go to war. Because we want peace. <laughs> what a twisted mind. What a twisted mind. You know, can you see how it plays with the words? <laughs> the point I wanted to make is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us wait to 50,000 50, years. Not half an hour, but 50,000 years. Just to show you how severe that day will be. And then when we are presented, right, when? الرحمن فلا تسمع إلا همسا. And, the, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes with his angels, all the voices are quiet. And so nothing is heard except whispers. How long only Allah knows. And then at that point, Allah will start the judgment. Amazing, isn't it? Just to create the suspense. And that's what Allah says. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الْفَصْلِ What will tell you the day of fasl will be? And so Allah doesn't even answer, answer it. And He goes directly into <coughs> warning the mukaddibin. <coughs> and He says, وَيْلُ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Woe to those who are liars on that day. أَلَمْ نُهْلِكِ الْأَوَّلِينَ Have they not seen how we have destroyed the nations of the past? Who are the nations of the past? The Ad and the Thamud and the Qawm of Fir'aun and, and Qawm of Lut and all of these people. Then we will also destroy the generations of the future. Meaning this is a, this is a promise from Allah that if we don't listen to him, Allah will destroy us as well. And of course, Allah was warning the Quraysh with this verse. Telling the Quraysh that if you do not listen and take the guidance of the reason why those people were destroyed, then I will follow their destruction with your destruction. In the same way will we do to those who are mujrimeen, those who are evildoers. Second time Allah says, Woe to those people who are mukaddibin, who are liars. Alam nakhlukum mimma mimma in mahin. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to the reasoning, logical reasoning of why he is so angry. That people do not think about who they are. You see, Ikhwati, one of the biggest problems why we sin, one of the biggest problems why we sin is we forget who we are. We forget we are human beings, we forget that we are insignificant creatures, we forget that we are simple creatures made from just a clot of blood. We forget where we are in comparison to Allah. And that is why Allah says, Nasu Allah fa ansahum anfusahum. They have forgotten Allah, so Allah has caused them to forget themselves. And that is the real reason why we sin, is because we forget who we are and how we are not as great as we think we are. Alam nakhlukkum mimma in maheen. Did we not create you from a insignificant, despicable fluid? Maheen means very despicable, okay, or very rep uh, 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 pungent and, and repulsive fluid. Maheen means something which is insignificant. So did we not create you from ma in maheen, from that fluid which is insignificant, the semen? فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارٍ makin. So we put that fluid in the qarar. Qarar means a vessel. Qarar is a vessel. And makin means protected. So Qarari makin means a protected vessel. What is Allah talking about? The womb. The womb of the mother. Did we not put that insignificant fluid from which we created human beings? Fi qarari makin in that vessel which is so significant. And ya khwati, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never ever spoken about the womb except in the highest of ways. Have you noticed? Can you think of all the verses in the Quran where Allah talks about the womb? Allah has always glorified the womb. In fact, In the authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is reported that when the womb was created, when Allah created the womb, the womb kept arguing with Allah. The womb kept arguing with Allah. The scholars of, the scholars of hadith mentioned that no creation had the audacity to argue for their haqq and right with Allah. Even the angels did not. No one had the audacity to argue for their haqq with Allah except for the womb. So in the authentic hadith, It is reported that the womb kept on arguing with Allah until Allah said to the womb, what will please you? 
shall I cut off the one who cuts you off? And the womb said, yes, ya Allah. So Allah said, for it will be. Meaning that anyone who disobeys their parents, anyone who breaks their lineage of their womb, their line of the womb, okay? So you break your, your family ties. Allah will break your ties with you in the Akhirah. He will not listen to you. He will not enter you in Jannah. He will not listen to your anything at all and he will throw you in Jahannam. This is if you break the ties. In one authentic narration, it is reported that if man qata'a rahimahu yaqta'ullah in the authentic hadith, it is reported that that whoever breaks his ties of kingship, may Allah break his ties with him. May Allah break his ties with him. And I'm saying this, this is very, very important. You know why I'm saying this? Because I know in our families, in our culture, there's always a black sheep. And what we tend to do is because of the presence of that black sheep or that black apple in our families, we tend to break up. Oh, my uncle married uh, uh, her, his wife who was bad and so we don't speak to the uncle anymore and neither do we speak to his family anymore. Or uh, my father-in-law uh, married another wife and so we hate him now. So we, we, you know, what is this? What are you doing? You're destroying your future. You're destroying your future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not allowed you ever to break your ties of kingship. Never. If you break your ties of ties of kingship, Allah will break you on the day of judgment. Allah will break your ties on the day of judgment. In fact, in fact, imagine how great jihad is. Yet Allah has said that anyone who goes to jihad without his parents' permission, he will not be able to enter Jannah at all. In fact, Allah has created a place called Al-Araf, which is a place between Jannah and Jahannam. This is in Surah Al-Araf, which, which is in Surah number 7. A place between Jannah and Jahannam. Who are the people in Al-Araf? Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu said the people in Al-Araf are the people who went to jihad and they died in jihad. So Jahannam is haram for them. But they disobeyed their parents and so Jannah is haram for them. My brothers and sisters in Islam, take your qarar and makin seriously. Take your parents seriously. Ya ikhwati, I used to see my shaykh treat his family the most unbelievable way. My Shaykh Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shanqiti was reported that he would not sleep on the second floor because he used to say, I cannot sleep above my parents. They used to say my Shaykh would not speak in the presence of his father because he would be afraid that his father would speak before him and he would interrupt his father. And our Shaykh used to tell us, do not eat when your parents are eating from the food. It may be that they want to eat from that particular meat that you are, you are about to put your, your, your food forward. And we know the children today, they do the opposite. They take their food first before they give it to their parents. Our Shaykh used to tell us, it is haram to travel without the permission of your parents. So I used to say, Ya Shaykh, but my parents have other children. I have two other brothers. Why not? So my Shaykh used to say, but you could be the Yusuf of your parents. You could be Yusuf. Yaqub had 11 other children. Yet it was Yusuf that he loved the most. So it does not matter who you are. And he, it does not matter you have other children. You are the Yusuf for your parents. And so no way, under no circumstances, must you travel without your, your parents. So I remember asking my Shaykh, Ya Shaykh, what if my parent tells me to divorce my wife? Question which I'm asked all the time. My Shaykh said, listen to your parents. Allahu Akbar, Ya Shaykh. Allahu Akbar, Ya Shaykh. Alhamdulillah, my, my parents never asked me to divorce my wife. <laughs> so make sure you bribe your parents. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make, Ya is never, ever, ever break your ties or kingship with your parents. In the authentic hadith in Mustad Imam Ahmed, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah is angry at the man who prefers his wife over his mother. He said what? Allah is angry with the man who prefers his wife over his mother. Ask yourself, do you buy your wife a present or your mother a present for Eid? Which one? And why do I see brothers smiling? Because I know which one it is that you first buy, isn't it? Your wife, because she's going to cook you food for Eid. Ya akhi, Allah musta'an. Do not prefer your mothers, your, pa your wives over your mothers. And for those wives who are feeling bad, let me tell you, do not feel bad. Because your children will also be told to prefer you over over their wives as well, inshallah.
طيب, so do not be, be sad at all and preserve this and tell your husband to prefer their mothers over you because this is their Jannah and their Jannah is under their feet. So Allah says, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ And we put it, and we put this insignificant fluid in the Qararim Makin, in the vessel which is protected. إِلَىٰ قَدْرٍ معلوم, To a duration of time that is well known. What is the duration of time that is well known? We know it is a minimum of six months and a maximum of about 10 to 11 months. Okay, 10 to 10 and a half. Anything more than that, the child will die. The scholars of the four madhabs have differed what they meant, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means by qararim makin. Some of the scholars said it can be up to three years or four years. This is in the classical madhahib of the Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki and Hanbali madhabs. However, this is incorrect. This is incorrect because medical knowledge today tells us that if the baby is within the womb for more than this duration of time, more than 42, 44 weeks, it will start to die. It will be too big for the mother, right? It will either mother will die or the baby will die. So this is incorrect. This is a mistake. Uh, but this is important to point out that today we have a lot of medical knowledge that can help us understand many of the ahkam al fiqih as well. So ila qadrin ma'loom means from six months all the way till ten and a half months. And how big is a six month old baby? It's like a Pepsi can. Have you seen a Pepsi can? That's literally how small they are. And the doctors mentioned that below six months a baby cannot, cannot survive because the lungs cannot survive. So we have judged it and we have apportioned the time. So glory be to Allah, the best of planners and the best of proportioners. Best of those who give proportions. Glory be to Allah, isn't he? Isn't Allah great, the one who gives the best proportions? The scholars of science, they say that the universe has no less than 27 constants. 27 variables that are constant in, in time, constants, that if they were different, human life would not be possible. Like the distance of the earth from the sun, like from the amount of ozone, the, the amount of oxygen in the air. If the amount of oxygen you were, were to increase, we would become blind. Do you know that? And that is why children become blind when they are given 100% oxygen for too long in the hospitals. That's why we don't tend to give it like that. We tend to give it. If you, if you see... Patients are not given oxygen, children not given oxygen by the mouth for too long. Otherwise they become blind. Oxygen tends to destroy the eyes. So, Yekhwati, when Allah says, فَقَدَرْنَا فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ Only Allah knows how great He is. Because only Allah knows how many of the variables, the percentages of everything in the dunya that Allah has put for life to be possible uh, in, this, in this earth. Allahu Akbar. فَقَدَرْنَا فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ Glory be to Allah, نِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ the third time Allah says, Woe to those who are liars. Alam Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on from giving the example of where human beings came from to the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ayat of Allah, we should make people ponder about the existence of our Creator. And one of the ayat of Allah is, of course, the earth. So Allah says, Alam Najalil Arda Kifata. Have we not made the earth a kifata? What's a kifata? Kifata comes from the word kiffa or kuffa. What does kiffa mean? Kiffa means like when you put your palm outstretched, this is called bust. When you make it into a cuff, meaning you put your palms together into a cuff, into a cup, right? That's called a kiffa, okay? So a kiffa means something which covers up, okay? When the hand's covering up, it's called the covering up. So, ya akhwati, alam naj'ali al-arda kifata means did we not make the earth a covering? Ahya'a wa amwata, meaning did we not make the earth a covering for both the living and the dead? So how is the earth a covering? The scholars of tafsir such as, such as uh, Qutayba and others, <coughs> they said that ahya'an, the earth is a covering because of the, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing us to build houses and homes from the materials in the earth and so it has covered us up so it is covering us from the elements outside so that is the kifata outside for the ahya for the amwat for the dead then it is a kifata because they are in the graves so the earth is a so the, is a, uh, the earth is a kifa the graves are a kifa for the dead bo dead body alam najalil ardh kifata ahya aw amwata have we not made the earth 
a covering and a vessel for both the living and the dead. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا رَوَاسِي And we have, we have put in it rawasi. What is rawasi? Are mountains. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ شَامِخَ شَامِخَ meaning lofty mountains. So look at the lofty mountains. Have we not put in the earth lofty mountains? شَامِخَاتٍ رَوَاسِيَ شَامِخَاتٍ وَأَسْقَيْنَاكُمْ مَا أَنْفُرَاتًا And we have given you أَسْقَيْنَاكُمْ uh, meaning we have given you to drink. Ma'an water, furata in, in countless measures. Woe to those who are liars, those who see these signs and still disbelieve in Allah. In taliku, in taliku ila ma kuntum bihi tukadibun. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on and tells us about the day of judgment when they're all raised up. When they're raised up, now feel the anger of Allah that these people did not listen to the signs. They did not listen to the signs of where they came from or did not look at the signs of the earth around them. Ya ikhwati, whenever you see the verses of the Qur'an talking about the signs of Allah, it is a recommendation from Allah to go out in the land and see the signs of Allah. We know that Ramadan is coming to an end and holiday period is coming for a few days. I sincerely request that you use your holidays not to live in the cities and to be within the mount, to be within the man-made areas but go to the wilderness go to the lakes go to Lankawi perhaps go and see the rivers go and see the mountains go and see the wilderness and see the creation of Allah Azawajal. you know whenever I come towards this way towards Gombak I see the sign for Genting and I go towards Genting you know the mountains are so amazing and beautiful and if you go to Genting you see how the clouds are coming down on the mountains and you go on the cable and you see how the mountains of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how amazing are the creation of Allah azawajal. You have to see the signs of Allah and appreciate. If you go to Australia, go to this place called the Great Ocean Road. Great Ocean Road, ya salam. Ya salam. How amazing is this place. Or go to this place called uh, St. John's Promontory. St. John's Promontory, don't worry, it's a Christian name, but it's very nice. St. John's Promontory is a place where the mountains of Australia reach the beaches of Australia. Yes, Salam. Just the beach and just behind it are the mountains. So amazing. So amazing. When you go there, you're filled with, with uh, just, will, just you know, amazement of the creation of Allah. How amazing and how beautiful are the creation of Allah. Or if you go to Canada, go through the beautiful ranges of Canada and you see subhanAllah most amazing things anyway we'll talk about trips and travels <laughs> you know it's very bad talking to someone like me when I travel so much uh, but it's one of the blessings of Allah Azawajal. you see the khalq of Allah in its full blazing glory طيب. In ila ma kuntum bihi tukadhibun. go to that which you have been lying against which is the one what have they been lying against Jahannam right in Taliku, go now to that which you've been lying against, meaning go to Jahannam. In Taliku ila dhillin di thalathi shu'ab. Go to that which has a dhill. Okay? The dhill of the thalatha shu'ab. Go to that. Can you see over there the dhill, the, uh, which is the shade? Go to that which you can find the shade of the three columns. What is Allah referring to here? Thalathi shu'ab means three, shu'ab means columns. Dhil means uh, the, sh the, sh the, the, what do you call it? The shadow, I'm sorry, not the shade, but the shadow, correct. Dhil is the shadow. So go to that which you find the shade, uh, which, which you find the three shadows. Can you see the three columns and three shadows? Go to it. So Allah will say, go to this place. So what is this three shadows? What is it? Well, the scholars of Islam, they describe Jahannam that every time Jahannam is burning, it is throwing out smoke. And the smoke is so huge that it creates a cover of shadows. So we know that the believers will have the shadow of the throne of Allah, correct? Because we know seven people will, will be shaded, seven people will have the shade of Allah on the day of judgment, correct? And by shade of Allah, we mean the shade of the throne of Allah, correct? But the disbelievers, they will seek shade as well, okay? Because the tremendous heat, they will seek the shade. So Allah will tell them and the angels will tell them, you want shade? 
Those, that shade is not for you. That shade is for the people who are the muttaqi, right? You go to that place. See there? Can you see the shade there? Go to that place. Can you see the three column shade? Go there. So they will go there. On the day of judgment, they will go to this place where they will find three huge shades. But they will find there in something else. What will they find? They will find that it is a sauna. That it is a smoke cloud. A smoke cloud of three columns that are coming out of Jahannam. That has created shade. And that shade is not actually shade at all. It is nothing but fire and heat. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say. In taliqu ila dhillin di thalati shu'ab la dhalil. It does not provide you any real shade. Wala yughni min al-lahab. Nor does it actually provide a covering from the lahab which is the fire. From the lahab or the fire or the flames of Jahannam. So it is a mirage. These shades are mirage. Although the shade of the believers will be from the shade of the throne of Allah, which is a real shade, but for the disbelievers on that day will be a false shade that will not provide anything but ma yughni min al lahab. It will not provide any protection from the lahab. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Jahannam. Look at the description of Jahannam from the words of Ar Rahman, the creator of Jahannam. Look what he said. He says, Innaha tarmi bi shararin kal qasar. Verily, it will throw, verily Jahannam throws out sharar. What does it do? Verily, Jahannam throws out sparks. Kal qasar. Like it is qasar. Qasar means palace. Okay? Innaha, verily it, tarmi, throws out. Rami is to throw. Innaha tarmi, verily throws out. Bi shararin, which is sparks. Kal qasar, as huge as castles. Like this big, big beautiful Masjid subhanallah Ka'annaha jimalatun sufur It is as if Jimalatun sufur What's jimal? Jimal means jamal Okay Jimal is another word of plural for jamal Jimalatun sufur Sufur means reddish yellowish tinge So what is Allah talking about? The Arabs of the past They used to call black camel sufur Okay he used to, They used to call black camel sufur Sufr means reddish yellowish. So why would they call black sufr? Strange. Well, they used to call it black, black camel sufr because not all the hair of the camel, of a black camel is black, number one. It is usually, it contains some tinges of yellowish reddish. Okay? So they used to call these camels sufr. Also, they would, they would call them sufr because in the black of the night, in the black of the night, the yellowish reddish camel used to look black with a tinge of yellowish and orangish tinge as well okay and that's why they would call the black camel sufur so even though it's calling sufur don't understand it to mean yellowish camel that the sparks are yellowish no the sparks are black but they have a tinge of red meaning that imagine when the sparks come and they fall have you seen them when they're dying out when they're dying out the sparks are black but they have a still a little bit of lighted area hot area that is looking red Do you know what i'm talking about and so that is the sparks that are coming out. That is the jimalatun sufur. Ka'annaha jimalatun sufur. Wailu yawma idhil lil mukadhibin. Woe to those people who are liars on that day. Hada yawmu la yantiqoon. In this day, they will not speak at all. This is a day when they will not be allowed to speak. So ya khuti, Allah has given you an ability to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now to speak. If we die as disbelievers, la qaddar Allah, then we will never be able to speak again. Not will we never be able to see, nor will we be able to hear, but we will also never be able to speak again. Why? Because Allah does not want to hear them anymore. Allah doesn't want them to speak at all. Hada yawmu la yantiqoon. Scholars of Islam, they mention that either Allah will, will create them without a mouth, or their mouth will be sealed, or as some of the scholars mention, that whenever they try to speak, the angels will smash them on their faces. Okay? The angels will hit them on their faces. So, هَذَا يَوْمُ لَا يَنْتِقُونَ Today, they will not be able to speak at all. وَلَا يُؤْذَنُ لَهُمْ فَيَعْتَذِرُونَ Nor will they be given a permission. For what? So that they can repent and seek, seek an excuse. Meaning they will say, Oh Allah, please, please, just listen to, give us one chance. لَا يُؤْذَنُ No chances. For them to 
seek a forgiveness. Ye ikhwati, no chance to seek forgiveness after you die. No chance to seek forgiveness after you die. All the chances right now. وَلَا يُؤْذَنُ لَهُمْ فَيَعْتَذِرُونَ وَيْلُوا يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Again Allah says, Woe to those people who are liars on that day. هَذَا يَوْمُ الْفَصْلُ Today is the day of division. جَمَعْنَاكُمْ وَالْأَوَّلِينَ The day of judgment. We have gathered you and those before you. Meaning your forefathers as well. أَوَّلِينَ Meaning those before you, your forefathers. فَإِنْ كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدُونَ فَكِيدُونَ so if you have a plan to attack my plan, if you have a plan to destroy me, if you have a plan to destroy my Jahannam, if you have a plan to get out, Fakidun, this is your time. Show us your plan. Carry out your plan now. Allahu Akbar. Can you feel the power of Allah Zawajal? Yeah, can you see the power of Allah Zawajal? The scholars of Islam, they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has three types of attributes. First attribute are those which are perfect attributes. Like Rahman, Rahim, Mercy, Ghufran, etc. This is only established fully for Allah. Number two, the second type of attributes are the negative attributes. Like sleep, like nisyan, forgetfulness, like ghulm, transgression. This is totally denied from Allah. La ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la no sleep nor slumber overtakes him, okay? So these are the second type of attributes, those that are denied totally from Allah. The third are those types of attributes which from one side is positive and the other side is negative. Like Kaid, like Makar, like Istihza. What is Kaid? Kaid is plotting. Makar is mockery. Istihza is to mock and joke. Joke in a, in a negative way. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we establish these attributes for Allah in the positive way and we deny it from Him in the negative way. So we cannot call Allah Makir. A'udhu Billah. We cannot. This is not the name of Allah, nor can we call Allah Makir. Even though Allah says, Yamkuruna wa Yamkurullah. Wallahu khairul makirin. They mock and Allah mocks them and Allah is the best of mockers. Even though Allah says this, this does, does not mean that Allah is Makir. Why not? Because Makar is bad. But makar is good when it is in opposition to your enemies who are trying to do the same to you. So if your enemies are plotting and planning, does it not show quwa and izzah and honor and strength if you can do it back to them? It does, doesn't it? And that's why, ikhwati, when you read the verses of Allah that talk about makar and kaid, do not understand from it the negative sense. Understand it that Allah will only mention these attributes in the positive sense when in opposition to his enemies. Tayyip. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ فَكِيدٌ If you truly have a plan, then carry it out. This only shows strength because Allah's plan has now overtaken them. يَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ They were mocking, but Allah will mock them on the day of judgment. They are plotting. يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا They are plotting and planning, but I am plotting and planning. And what is my plot and plan? This is the plot and plan. Which is a day of judgment. Because if you have a kaid, now let's show us your kaid. Show us your plot and plan. Woe to those people who are liars on that day. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to talking about the believers. Just like in the, in the other verse in Surah Insan, only one verse about Jahannam and then it was all about Jannah. Now it was all about Jahannam. Now it's a few verses about Jannah as well. Okay? MashaAllah. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? Inna al muttaqina fi dhilali wa ayoon. Verily, the believers and the muttaqoon, those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be in the dhilal, will be in the shade of Allah. Which shade? Those people are in the shade of the three columns of smoke of Jahannam. Whereas the muttaqoon will be in the dhilal, the shade of the throne of Allah on the day of judgment. Wa ayoon. Meaning in paradise, they will be with the rivers. Uyun means springs. Okay? A spring, the tributaries of the rivers. And food from the fruits of Jannah. From what they used to love to eat. What sort of fruit do you like to eat here, Akhi? It's okay, we can talk about it. It's alright. What sort of fruit do you like to eat? Come on. Please don't tell me durian, Akhi. Because there's no durian in Jannah, yeah. 
No, no, it's not possible, yeah. It smells too much. <laughs> no, I'm, sure, I'm sure there will be a special durian for you all, inshallah. That smells like musk, inshallah, right? <laughs> and tastes like, like durian. But khair. Uh, but mangoes, right? Isn't mangoes something we love? We're Asians. We all love mangoes, mashallah, right? Or peaches or strawberries. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when we are given the fruits of Jannah, when we're given the fruits of Jannah, we will exclaim and we will say, Oh, this is the same thing I used to eat before. Okay? So when you ever you have a fruit of Jannah being presented to you, you will make an exclamation. Oh, is this the mango that I used to eat before? But when you take a bite of it, it will be the most exquisite taste. So before you eat it, you think, oh, it's a strawberry. But then when you bite the strawberry, it will taste very different. It will taste like nothing in this dunya. In the authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in Bukhari, he said, if one of the fruits of Jannah, he said, what? Well, listen to the hadith. He said, if one of the fruits of Jannah were to descend down to this earth, all of the people of this earth could eat from it until the day of judgment. Ya salam. Can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> Can't wait. Allahumma sta'an. Allahumma give it to us. Ya Rab. Ya Rab. If you say, Oh Allah, give us Jannah three times. Jannah says, Oh Allah, let him enter me. Okay? So make Jannah say, Oh Allah, let him enter me. By asking Allah, begging Allah. It was reported that the Prophet Sallallahu whenever he read the Quran at night, he would stop at every verse of Jannah and he would say, Oh Allah, give me Jannah, give me Jannah, give me Jannah. And he would stop at every verse of punishment and he would say, Oh Allah, save me from Jahannam. Save me from Jahannam, save me from Jahannam. وَفَوَاكِهَ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ and the fruits from what they used to love. Kulu washrabu and eat and drink. Hani ambima kuntum ta'amalon. Be blessed and be happy for that which you used to do. Inna kadalika najzil muhsineen. In the same way do we reward those who do ihsan. Muhsinun are those who do ihsan. Ya ikhwati, muhsinun are a level higher than iman. Muhsinun are a level higher than Iman. There is Muslimun. Then comes Mu'minun. Then comes Mu'minun. Then comes Muhsinun. Then comes Abrar. Okay? Then comes Abrar. We must struggle, struggle and strive to improve our action. Each action can become just Islam or can become Iman or can become Ihsan or can become uh, Bir. Each action can. And it can by the closeness of you following the sunnah, the, the closeness of you having ikhlas to Allah, how perfectly you try and hide it from everyone else's face, and how sincere you are in benefiting others. So every action, that is why the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, La tasubbu ashabi, do not curse my companions. For verily, each one of you cannot give the mountain of Uhud in charity, and it will never ever equal even a handful of gold that they have given in charity. Why? Can you explain to me, when I read this hadith, I had a question in my mind. In my mind. Is Allah partial? Does Allah love the Sahaba more than us just because he's partial to them? Or is there another reason? And the answer is there's another reason. It's because the intention and the ikhlas and the purity of the action that the Sahaba had with one action, which was so simple, like a handful of gold to, in charity, is very different from what we have today. What we have, Ya Ikhwati, is rush and, and roughness. Let me give you an example, Ya Ikhwati. Let me give you an example. You have come here today to gain knowledge. What intention did you have when you came to this class? What intention did you have? Akhi, what intention did you have? To understand the surah more. Anything else? Be truthful. That's it. Probably. Okay. How about you, Akhil Kareem? Muhammad Faris. Hi. Sorry? Faisal. Sorry, Akhi. Khair. Well, Allah make you a Faris. Okay, go ahead. So, what intention did you have? To make my father happy. Ahsanta, ya Habibi. Ahsant. You are better than all of us. Because, inna rida Allah fi rida al the happiness of Allah is the happiness of your father. You make Allah, you make your father happy, Allah will be happy at you. Ahsant. But that was your one intention? Also to gain knowledge. Two intentions. So you're getting double the reward. 
It's as if you're sitting here for two hours, not one hour. It's true, ya khuti. The point is, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, actions are by intentions. If you make one intention before coming here, you, that's all you're going to get. And that's why our Shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon him, used to tell us, do not come to the class, my class, except you have a minimum of three intentions. Minimum of three, so that you get the reward three times. It's as if you've attended my class three times, or three separate classes. What are the three intentions? He used to say, رَفْعُ الْجَهَلْ عَن نَفْسِي وَرَفْعُ الْجَهَلْ عَن غَيْرِي وَحِفْظَ sunnah وَحِفْظَ sharia. He used to tell us, have these three intentions, minimum, minimum. Other than, of course, Birr al and other things as well. What are the three intentions he used to tell us? He used to say, first intent, that you're coming in order to remove ignorance from yourself. And number two, you're coming to remove ignorance from others. So you'll take this knowledge and spread it to others. And the third intention is that I'm coming to learn this knowledge so I will preserve the Sharia and knowledge, Islamic knowledge in my heart. And so Sharia will not be lost and knowledge will be preserved. Does that make sense, Ikhwati? So you get rewarded, rewarded three times. You get rewarded three times. And that's why the Sahaba used to say that we never used to start our action until we perfected our intention. And so they used to wait and add enough intentions. They used to say, as Shafi'i rahimullah, he said, the Sahaba used to have 70 intentions with every action. 70 intentions with every action. That's why they had 70 times the reward. That's why one, one handful of gold was equal to a mountain of Uhud in charity. So my brothers in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to perfect your intention with your, with your action. And that is why, ikhwati, ihsan, your same lead, one deed could become muhsin, could become ihsan, if you perfect and increase your intention. Does that make sense? So ikhwati, be of those people who do not rush to do actions. And that's why one of the things I hate when I see people as, Akhi, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, good. Okay, can you wait one minute? I've got to pray salah. Okay, just one second, one second. Allahu Akbar. So what the heck was that? What did, what did you just do? I mean, did you even intend? Did you know who in front of who you're standing? Of course, I'm sure you had some intention that you're going to pray, you know, Tahiyat uh, al-Masjid or something. But did you please take a moment to fill your heart with intention? And that's the whole point, Ikhwati. That's the whole point. Think about what you're going to do before you do it and think about all the reasons you're going to do it and then inshallah do that action so that you increase the reasons why you're doing it and so an action doesn't become just iman it becomes ihsan and more than that as well inshallah Tayyip, very important it's a lesson my shaykh used to tell us all the time Tayyip فَإِن كَانَ لَكُمْ إِنَّ كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ In the same way we do to those who are good doers. Woe to those who are liars on that day. Kulu qalilan innakum mujrimun. Eat and drink for a while, for indeed you are the wrongdoers. And this verse is a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give non Muslims more money than us. The scholars of Tafsir said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give non -Muslim, Muslims more money and more wealth than us in order to misguide them, in order to convince them that they are upon the right and upon the haq. And that is why the authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu states, if you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as you should love him, then poverty will reach you faster than the wind. Meaning, if you are a true believer, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you with poverty. But disbelievers, he will not test them with poverty. If he gives them poverty, it's a punishment, at the time of punishment. But most of the time, Allah will Test them with the opposite, which is more wealth and more children in order to confuse them that they are upon right. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, the last hour will not come until the Christians are largest in number. The hadith is authentic, it's in Bukhar, it's in Muslim. He said what? The last hour, final hour will not come until the Christians are the largest in number. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them every means to increase and grow in order to not bring them closer to Islam. If they, this is of course because of them rejecting Islam in the first place. Ya uh, Ikhwati, what is the number of Christians today, now at this point in time? Muslims, about 1.5 billion, but amongst them of course are many sects and groups that say they are Muslim but they are not really Muslim. Uh, like for example the Baha'iya and the Ismailiya and others very extreme deviant sects of the Shia, for example, and they say that they are from the Muslimin, but they're not. Uh, Aga Khanis, etc., and others who are from the extreme, extreme sects. 
So ya ikhwati, no doubt that 1.5 billion is counted from them as well. However, from the Christians, approximately 2 billion now. 2 billion. And what we do know is that though Muslims are increasing in number by way of the number of people by our birth rate, we are not increasing by way of conversions. We are not increasing by way of conversions. We are only increasing by way of birth rate only. So it is still possible, indeed possible, that the Christians will be the largest of number before the Day of Judgment. Kulu wa tam'atta'u qalilan inna mujrimun. Eat and drink for a while, for indeed you are you are wrongdoers. Wailu yawma idhil lil mukaddibin. Again, Allah says the same thing. Wa idha qila lahum urka'u la yarka'un. And when it is said to them, prostrate, they do not prostrate to Allah Azza wa Jal. Yeah, when it is said to them, prostrate, they do not prostrate. It is for this reason why, uh, why the scholars of the four madhabs agree that when the adhan is given, you're not allowed to leave the masjid. When the adhan is given, you're not allowed to leave the masjid unless you're making wudu. Okay? All four madhabs upon the same opinion. Because the adhan is the hayya ala salah wa hayya ala al-falah. And that's what Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَرْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ so if someone says, okay, no, no, I know the adhan's given, but I'm going to go home and pray. Or I'm going to go, you know, later, I'll pray later on, I've got a, I've got a meeting to go to. Abad al Not allowed. However, if you hear the adhan outside the masjid, yes, you can carry on and you can pray, your, you can say your salah a little bit later. Or you hear the adhan at your work and you can pray the salah a little bit later. But the point is, point is in the masjid, you're not allowed to do so. You cannot leave the masjid if the adhan is given because of this verse. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَرْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ وَيْلُوا يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ And it is for this reason why once it was reported that Imam Malik rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'ah Imam Malik rahimahullah walked into the masjid after Dhuhr, after Asr prayer and as you know the Maliki opinion which is the same as the Hanafi opinion is that after Asr you should not pray the Tahiyyat al-Masjid it is only the Shafi'i and the Hanbali opinion that you should pray the Tahiyyat al-Masjid Alakulli hal, Imam Malik rahimullah walked into the masjid. It was reported once he walked into the masjid after Asr prayer. And a young boy came and said, Hey, you, don't sit down. Pray. <laughs> Told him to pray. And so he said, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and he prayed. So afterwards, his students saw the Imam and said, Ya Imam, I thought your opinion is not to pray Tahit al Masjid after, after Asr. He said, Yes, but khashitu an akuna. But I was afraid that I would be from this verse. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ مُرْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ Allahu Akbar. And that is why, wallahi, we had a teacher in the university. His name was Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Shanqiti. He was the greatest mufassir of this century. Okay, the greatest scholar of tafsir of this century was the, a scholar by the name of Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Shanqiti. He passed away. He was the teacher of Bin Baz with Amin and others. And he used to, when he gave his tafsir in the, in the Prophet's masjid in Medina, all the kibar ulama used to sit there. He was that, that great, mashallah. So, Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqidi, rahimahullah, they used to say that they banned Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqidi from the exam hall. Why did they ban him from the exam hall? They said, no, everyone is allowed in the exam hall except Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqidi. He can't be a mushrif. He can't be a supervisor for any exams. Why? Because if any of the students said, yeah, Sheikh, what's the answer to this question? He would say, okay, the answer is this. <laughs> he said, why, yeah, Sheikh? Why do you tell them the answer? He said, because Allah says in the Quran, Inna ladina yaktubuna ma anzal Allahu min al-bayyinati wal-huda min ba'di ma bayyannahu lil-nasi ulaika alayhim la'natullahi wal-malaikati wal-nasi ajma'in Those who hide the knowledge after the knowledge of Allah has been made, made, uh, made clear to him, then upon him is the curse of Allah and the angels and all of mankind. So he said, khashitu an yakun anakuna mithl hadha. So I was afraid I would be from this verse. <laughs> so they had to ban him. They had to ban him, yeah? They had to ban him. It was said that, that, that Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti, he used to beg his students not to ask him questions. He used to beg him. He used to literally cry, do not ask me questions. Because I have to answer it. <laughs> Allah yarham, Allah yarham al-Sheikh. Allahu Akbar. Allah yarham al-Sheikh. Subhanallah. So many stories to tell you about this. But inshallah, another time. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَرْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ When it is told to them to prostrate, they don't prostrate. Wailu yawma idhil lil mukadhibin. Woe to those who lie on that day. And the final verse of this juz. Fabi ayi hadithim ba'dahu yu'minun. So after this Quran, in which speech will you believe in, ya khuti? 
Allahu Akbar. What a beautiful way to end this juz, isn't it? If you don't believe in this, these surahs that you have read and you have spent time with me in Ramadan learning about, if you do not believe in this, in which other hadith will you listen to, Ya Rabbi? Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Glory be to Allah. What an amazing Quran. Let me recite in Arabic, inshallah. Now that you understand the meaning, now pay attention in Arabic, inshallah, uh, and, and follow through. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Mursalati Urfa, Fal Asifati Asfa, Wal Nashirati Nashara, Fal Farikati Farqa, Fal Mulkiati Dikra, Udran Aw Nudra. إنما توعدون لواقع فإذا النجوم طمست وإذا السماء فرجت وإذا الجبال نسفت وإذا الرسل أقتت لأي يوم أجلت ليوم الفصل وما أدراك ما يوم الفصل ويل يومئذ للمكذبين ألم نهلك الأولين ثم نتبعهم الآخرين كذلك نفعل بالمجرمين ويل يومئذ للمكذبين ألم نخلقكم من ماء مهين فجعلناه في قرار مكين إلى قدر معلوم فقدرنا فنعم القادرون ويل يومئذ للمكذبين ألم نجعل الأرض كفاتا أحياء وأمواتا وجعلنا فيها رواسي شامخات شامخات وأسقيناكم ماء فراتا ويل يومئذ للمكذبين انطلقوا إلى ما كنتم به تكذبون انطلقوا إلى ذل ذي ثلاث شعب لا ظنين ولا يغني من اللهب إنها ترمي بشرر كالقص كأنه جمالة صف ويل يومئذ للمكذبين هذا يوم لا ينطقون ولا يؤذن لهم فيعتذرون ويل يومئذ للمكذبين هذا يوم الفصل جمعناكم والأولين فإن كان لكم كيد فكيدون ويل يومئذ للمكذبين إن المتقين في ظلال وعيون وفواكه مما يشتهون كلوا واشربوا هنيئا بما كنتم بما كنتم تعملون إنا كذلك نجزي المحسنين ويل يومئذ للمكذبين كلوا وتمتعوا قليلا إنكم مجرمون ويل يومئذ للمكذبين وإذا قيل لهم اركعوا لا يركعون ويل يومئذ للمكذبين 
فبأي حديث بعده يؤمنون جزاكم الله خير I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his immense mercy to have mercy upon all of my brothers and my sisters in Islam who have listened to this class and have benefited from it and have been learning the Quran over the last few days. Ya akhwati, my brothers and my sisters in Islam, make a sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who are from those people who read the Quran and who implement its, its, its obligations, who listen to the Quran and implement its lessons. Ya ikhwati, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people who this, these beautiful surah uh, go and witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about us. I know many of you have told me, well, alhamdulillah, they've come close to Allah zawajal or come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these beautiful days of Ramadan uh, because of this tafsir. And so alhamdulillah, one of the things that I started to do which was a few days ago, just online on my Facebook page, etc., and others. I started a small challenge to see if uh, if we could uh, carry these these tafsirs more forward uh, and beyond, so that I could build a small team who could record this and could prepare these classes uh, and make it available in multiple languages uh, for all the people for free worldwide. Inshallah, Taala. Alhamdulillah, people have donated a lot of money. Alhamdulillah, I've got enough. Uh, I've got more than what I need, alhamdulillah. And uh, alhamdulillah, we're now about to close the challenge. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we're about to get ready recording the rest of the tafsirs of the, of the Quran, inshallah. If Allah wills, uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, gives us barakah, and if this beautiful masjid and this uh, university gives me permission, I will carry on, inshallah, the tafsir of the classes here as well. And we will, we will record them as well, inshallah, make it available for the people. If you're able to, ya try not to miss my classes of tafsir. Uh, what I will do is try and take a juz of the Qur'an every few months, inshallah. Every few months. So we know that a juz takes about 12 classes to finish. Sometimes it takes longer because the lessons are so many. It might take up to 15 classes. But you could finish one juz in a month uh, of only three or four classes in a week. So it is possible, inshallah. And if the brothers and sisters are able to do so, and inshallah there's interest in this, we will carry on inshallah, we will start with the tafsir of other ajza of the Qur'an inshallah ta'ala. And alhamdulillah, very soon you'll realize you're learning Arabic, very soon you'll realize you understand the Qur'an, and alhamdulillah you'll come closer and closer uh, to uh, the, the guidance of, uh, of, of Rasulullah sallallahu and this Qur'an. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you, and bless me, and bless my family, and you, and our mashayikh, and our ulama, and all of Islam and Muslimin, for this khair, I thank all my brothers. I wanted to thank my brother Qutayba for doing this hard work and we know we gave him difficulty and his family, uh, my team from Mercy Mission for uh, being here and supporting me in this cause. All the brothers uh, who have, mashallah, been recording this to all the brothers and sisters who have helped uh, record this and, and relay it live uh, on TV, on, uh, on, uh, online as well and been listening online. I know there's a couple of thousand there, mashallah, listening online. Alhamdulillah, it has benefited a lot of people. Actually, it's benefited me more than anyone else because it helps me uh, revise the surah and really think about the power of the surah uh, and the relevance of it in our lives. Uh, and finally, ikhwati, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who, uh, who memorize this Quran and be from its reciters. Uh, the scholars of Islam, they said that Jannah has a hundred levels. Some scholars said that. Other scholars said that Jannah has 5,600 something levels. And they said that it has 5,600 something levels. Why? Because of the hadith of Rasulullah that the person who recites the Quran and listens to its tafsir and its meanings will be asked to recite the Quran and ascend one level of Jannah with every verse that he recites. So do not belittle a verse of the Quran you have learned. It may be that with every verse you have learned, how many verses? I mean, look, Surah Mulk was 30. Then came Surah uh, Qalam, was about 50 verses, right? So with every verse, imagine you are ascending one level in Jannah. How amazing is that? So you've just taken now uh, Juz Tabarak. Perhaps, I don't know how many verses, I haven't counted, but at least 300, 400, 600 verses, 500 verses, perhaps. So SubhanAllah, can you imagine how many levels of Jannah you might have ascended? And the difference from one level to the other level is like the difference between this dunya and the and the heavens. Can you imagine how great that is? 
Do not belittle this knowledge you're gaining. Do not leave it. Do not forget it. Revise it. Go and teach it to others. It is possible for you to teach it to others. You can summarize a one hour lecture into 15 minutes. Just read them the, the verse and tell them, tell your wife or your future wife if you're not married yet or uh, your children or your friends and family out there. Go through the verses and tell them one or two benefits of each verse. Or if you do not know any more than that, just tell them a translation of it. At least, bi idhnillah, you're spreading this knowledge. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Balligu anni walaw ayah. Spread from me even one ayah, which is authentic hadith in Bukhari. Zakumullah khair. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who are forgiven. Uh, to make us of those people who are forgiven. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not allow us to part from this gathering except we have been forgiven. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rahman, O oh Allah, make us from those people who are forgiven today. O oh Allah, make us from those people who are freed from the fire today. Ya Rabbi, we kept constant upon this knowledge of the Qur'an. Ya Rabbi, make us of those people who recite the Qur'an. O oh Allah, make the Qur'an the Rabbi'a Qulubina wa Nura Sudurina wa Dhahaba Humumina wa Gumumina. O oh Allah, make us, make, us of, make us from the people of the Qur'an. Make the Qur'an from us, for us, a remover of the burdens. O oh Allah, make the Qur'an for us a remover of our worries and the removal of our problems. O oh Allah, make us the Qur'an, Rabi'a Qulubina, make the Qur'an for us a light and a witness and a nur and a sweetness for our hearts. O oh Allah, make us from the Ahlul Qur'an. O oh Allah, help your people, help your people who recite the Qur'an. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, verily you have said upon the tongue of your Prophet sallallahu those who recite the Qur'an, they are my people. O oh Allah, make us from your people, Ya Rabbi. We have not recited the Qur'an here. And we have not learned the Qur'an except that we believe in it. And you have said in your book, فَبِأَيِّ حَدِيثٍ بَعْدَهُ يُؤْمِنُونَ We are not going to believe in any other hadith other than your book, Ya Rabbi. So make us of those people who are forgiven, Ya Allah. For, for Ya Rabbi, we have only a few days left. If you don't forgive us, we are destroyed upon the tongue of your Prophet ﷺ, who said, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throw that person away, the one who reaches the end of Ramadan, and he is not forgiven. So Allah, make us of those people who are forgiven, Ya Rabbi. Make us of those people who you write freedom from Jahannam today, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, make us of those people who not only have the sweetness, don't only have the sweetness at the time of breaking our fast, but the best of sweetness the day we meet you, Ya Rabbi. Oh Allah, make us of those people who remind us of, of this ibadah on that day. Oh Allah, we're reciting this book in your house, Ya Rabbi. Make it come true, the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu who said no group of people come together in the house of Allah reciting the book of Allah except that the angels descend upon them and say and spread their salams upon them and Allah mentions them that which are with them. O oh Allah, make us of those people who are mentioned with, your, with the prophets who are with you and with the martyrs who are with you and with the angels who are with you. O oh Allah, accept us from your people. And O oh Allah, make us of those people who live up the sunnah of the Prophet and make us of those people who live up to his sunnah and spread the salam upon our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi wa sallam